There are many enigmatic giant ruins that can be found within Japan. Super megaliths, so old, a number of the largest have eroded away to a state of unrecognition. An archaeological site, which at the time of its life, would have undoubtedly dwarfed nearly all other civilizations upon Earth. A civilization which far outstretches the modern urban sprawl of the Japanese coastlines. A lost super-civilization responsible for the construction of numerous pyramids found throughout the landscape, some of which are said to lay beneath several meters of Earth, which has slowly consumed them over the millennia. Amongst these curious ruins are extremely perplexing, apparently sliced megalithic stones, pyramidal capstones, and also, like many places dotted around the world, legends of giants. One of the many things Japanese culture has become renowned for over the centuries is their ability to create swords, steel weapons of a far superior quality than their rivals, giving them an edge over their foes for many centuries. One must wonder, where did this advanced knowledge of sword making come from? Was it mere ingenuity? Or descended knowledge left by a far more superior, entirely different, and far larger race of people? Many sword-making technologies, which even to this day, impress and perplex the many specialists who delve into the nature of this advanced metallurgy. Amongst these enigmatic and amazing swords is one in particular, one that for obvious reasons stands out from the rest. Known as the Norimitsu Odachi, at over 12 feet in length and weighing nearly 15 kilograms in weight, this sword was masterfully created over 2,000 years ago, with no other intention than to be used by a warrior of gigantic proportions. The Nadachi type of sword was one of the weapons of choice on the field of battle during the Namboko Cho period. During this era and far before, these swords were rarely created for decoration purposes. The price of their construction, the time and care needed in creating just one single sword, meant that most were indeed manufactured for the purpose of battle. Additionally, the cost of creating such an enormous sword would have been considerable. Was this enormous sword once used by an equally enormous warrior? Understandably, many have denied such explanations as a tangible possibility. Yet regardless, a satisfactory explanation for the creation of such an amazing object remains to be seen. We are often confronted with peculiar, seemingly impossible artifacts that will, after some in-depth investigation, leave one with more questions than answers. This, either due to their enormous, often seemingly impossible sizes, megaliths in some locations weighing far over 1,000 tons, somehow, once used in their construction, sometimes set aloft, proof that not only were these stones hewn but moved and lifted seemingly with ease. But also, alas, the lack of public exposure many said sites are granted, often minimal at best, thus countless examples of advanced ancient technology remain still hidden here upon our planet. As a consequence, many have avoided scrutiny. Details therein which are clearly of a controversial nature are conveniently absent any funded studies of said ruins. We feel ruins of great importance but due to the strength of evidence one can surmount in support of past, once highly advanced ancient civilizations at said locations, they are largely overlooked and actively avoided by funded archaeologists, academics, and historians alike en masse. Simply ignored, thus preventing all from what we feel is a birthright, an accurate, warts and all, transparent exploration of the origins of humanity and, in turn, the history of our planet. Allowing one and all to make up their own minds in regard to the origin of said sites, no matter how controversial. This is the exact reason for the channel's creation, and is the driving force behind the six books one intends to write. A revolutionary cataloging of once, yet no more, deliberately overlooked or academically dismissed sites dotted all over the world. For when one explores our content, they will be made aware of a smorgasbord of unique and often inexplicable features which can be found all over Earth. In addition, it is not just the visible feats of ancient stoneworking 
that are the singular astonishing legacy left by a now lost, once highly advanced ancient civilization. For there are many other feats accomplished in a bygone era. Prehistoric mine shafts can still be found in many areas of Earth. Not only are there still existing, seemingly machine-cut, extremely ancient, incredibly deep mine shafts in a number of areas of Earth, including those featured found within Tel Aviv, are all but one among many relics, all clearly left by a capable group hidden from the world. But ancient cities exist also, ones covered previously, which were all once somehow cut from Earth's bedrock, that due to their location have fortunately been explored by a number of individuals over the years, never funded, but merely driven by curiosity. Thus, the true astonishing depth, and indeed the incredible achievement these once were, has all been previously documented. Civilizations that were once capable of not just digging these mines to incredible depths, but were, in fact, capable of creating entire temples from one gigantic solid stone, cut with such incredible artistic ability and accuracy, they are staggering examples of ancient engineering. In China and Japan, gigantic megaliths left, mysteriously abandoned, Easter Island, the unfinished obelisk Aswa, Egypt, Yangshan Quarry within China, all abandoned, with Yangshan possessing an almost detached megalith, clearly cut using incredible stone-cutting tools, a block estimated as weighing 16,000 tons when liberated from the bedrock. All these anomalies are but a few examples which support the premise of lost technology, knowledge, and an advanced civilization. It seems that the advanced mines, like those found in Tel Aviv, are but a tip of an archaeological iceberg in regards to the mystifying stone-cutting of a now lost antiquity. Why did humans placed within a lost chapter of antiquity exert such back-breaking effort in the attempt of extracting these precious metals? Who dug the Tel Aviv mines? Was it the same group who built ancient Peru? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. During our extensive research into the Neolithic Age, explorations into the countless Stone Age ruins, which can be found all over the world, a hypothesis began to form regarding their past possible identity. However, evidence continues to mount suggesting that this was incorrect. Stone Age ruins like that of Stonehenge are all part of an existing legacy of a civilization which, according to mainstream paradigm, lived over 10 millennia ago. A people who displayed incredible capabilities, not only in the quarrying, moving, and eventual placement of many stones in excess of 100 tons. The incredible displays of earthworking, mounds and barrows formed from thousands of tons of earth, all of which was once laid atop these underground layers. All of these remarkable features are indicative of a group who were once bestowed with tremendous capabilities. Research provided by various specialist fields, alignments displaying a past, intimate knowledge of solar processions, so complex, we have only very recently been able to fully understand just how astonishing their accuracy was. For Avebury within the UK holds Neolithic lunar alignments, found to be precise down to the fifth decimal. MH felt that due to the seemingly primitive nature of many Neolithic stone buildings that, although this ancient people clearly displayed incredible abilities, their structures on the surface, however, also appear not as advanced as many other enigmatic ancient builders. Due to this, we presented a thesis that the Neolithic people were a surviving fragments of a once far more capable yet now lost civilization. We theorized that these groups, scattered across the earth, still possessed the knowledge to move said stones, yet had lost advanced technology. We have instead unearthed fitting historical details to support another, more intriguing theory. We found that many Neolithic sites, clearly constructed over extended periods of time, share uncanny similarities in their constructions to other ruins located on other continents, even displaying a somewhat deliberate, intended use of rough, uncarved stones. And the Great Salbic Kurgan is no exception. An enormous Neolithic barrow found within modern-day Siberia, although locally known as a Kurgan, 
This barrow, just like that of the Flintstone-esque dolmens, also found across the world, is virtually identical to New Grange, a winter solstice to line barrow we have previously discussed in several videos. Thus, with this mounting, collaborative evidence, MH's hypothesis of Neoliths, having once been surviving groups of a post-cataclysmic world, has all but been proven wrong, and they were instead the work of a once flourishing, globe-trotting civilization. It would appear that these ancient monuments were built by a once prospering, worldwide society, and just like that of the pyramids of Giza, ancient Peru, Lebanon, China, along with countless others, were all constructed by past world-conquering superpowers, who fortunately left their proverbial fingerprints all over their particular sites, with the so-claimed Neolithic Age now found to be no exception to this rule. Who were the Neoliths? How are we supposed to believe the claim that these astonishing structures were somehow created by people wielding nothing but flints? and whom never made contact. How did this group align their monuments so accurately? And perhaps most important of all, what were these structures' original purposes? It is imperative that we continue to unravel that which has been successfully withheld from us for too long. It is a pursuit which we find highly compelling. We have in the past covered countless incredible and compelling ruins which can be found within Japan, indeed all over the world, upon which we continue to find connecting features which not only suggest there was once a global, ancient, highly advanced civilization, but the chance that these architectural techniques came about at the same time in history, the world over, by coincidence, is so slim that many said features, we feel, can instead only be seen as corroborating evidence of their past existence. Metal clamping techniques, enormous ancient megaliths, false doors, and the as yet to be fully understood polygonal masonry techniques have now been discovered the world over, and Japan is of no exception. Along with the polygonal masonry found upon the foundations of many temple sites, there is also the ancient fortresses of Okinawa which also display the same uncanny ability as other sites globally, constructed of seemingly random-shaped stones perfectly placed atop one another. Katsurin Castle, Zakimi Castle, among many other Gusuku castles or ancient fortresses found upon the Ryuku Islands within Japan, all contain this same ancient masonry technique, exhibiting this now lost knowledge and thus lost civilization's know-how. Although many of the sites are claimed as restorations, any explanation as to how this ancient masonry technique was replicated within modern history remains unexplained. We must then presume that the ancient sites which exhibit this lost technique have remained intact for untold millennia and have subsequently been misdated as constructed within known New World antiquities. Found upon such ancient sites, located within Peru, Egypt, Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, even as far as the notoriously remote Easter Island, these sites all exhibiting the same lost masonry technique. How can we continue to take these discoveries for granted, dismissed by academics, simply due to modern paradigm, absent any logical argument to explain or indeed disregard this proof? of a now lost yet once global super civilization having once been responsible. They must continue to rely on the Bering Strait theory of human migration and ignore any site which is indicative of not only earlier construction but matching characteristics with other sites the world over, which according to said theory simply could not have been visited by ancient civilizations, long argued as a feat which ancients were incapable of. The evidence which contradicts these claims, however, can be found still in existence upon these ancient sites. How old are the ancient fortresses of Ryuku Islands, or indeed the other polygonal sites throughout Japan and the rest of the world? Who were responsible for these incredible sites? We feel simply dismissing the evidence which shows they were the work of the same civilization is not only illogical but is a great example of the ignorance of mainstream-funded institutes 
in regard to a possible lost chapter in human history. It is a journey of discovery which we find highly compelling. We recently covered the astonishing ancient megaliths known as the Colossus of Memnon, a pair of 1,000-plus ton statues that have not only survived unknown eons into the modern day, but still possessed some of their most intriguing features all the way into known recorded history, most notably during the Roman Empire, when they were often regarded as having been able to sing at first light every day. We also touched upon the little-known conclusion, made by a number of individuals and even funded academics, referring to many other enigmatic artifacts that have been found across Giza, and even Egypt as a whole, as having been once lathe-worked. These often stone artifacts are so precise in their construction, with pottery even displaying a level of delicacy from their makers, that the only explanation for their existence could be attributed to having once been machine-worked, with the ancient Egyptians, claimed as their so-called makers, having once possessed enormous lathes, something modern man has only understood and utilized for a very brief time span, with a number of multi-ton sarcophagi also sharing this explanation for their creation. As to explain them as having once been made merely by hand is not only illogical, but almost an inconceivable tale to attach to such precisely made stonework. Created with not only astonishing symmetry, but also an astoundingly delicate and precise attention to detail, which modern man has only attained using modern lathes. Yet any explanation as to how these lathes were powered, how these individuals worked such enormous stones, or indeed what tools they utilized to cut such hard stones, remains largely unexplained. It is as if modern academia had been cornered by these past capabilities of this now lost civilization, having to admit that such precision can only be accomplished with seemingly advanced technology, yet, conveniently, leaving any practical explanation of what these technologies looked like, where they went, or how they were made or used, absent from their explanations of these incredible artifacts. Yet, interestingly, Ancient Egypt is not the only place which contains these remarkable relics. Baba Lovo, also known as Baba Lovka Palace, is a historical building located near the city of St. Petersburg, Russia. This palace was built towards the end of the 18th century, during the reign of Catherine II of Russia. And one of the most astonishing relics found within this building is the so-called bathtub, which is claimed to have been made for the Tsar Alexander I. This explanation of origin is regardless of its incredible size, symmetry, and indeed precision, in which it was once cut with precision that just like the enigmatic artifacts that can be found within Egypt, should only have a logical explanation of creation, which included that of a lost technology, or more specifically, an enormous lathe and heavy-duty yet precision-cutting instruments. Yet curiously, this explanation is absent from mainstream academia's explanation as to the origins of this enormous multi-ton stone dish. Nero's bathtub is yet another smoking gun of this now lost technology and indeed lost civilization. And although the vaults beneath where it lay within the Vatican measures an incredible 25 kilometers in length, packed full of hidden writings, artifacts, and historical controversies, this so-called bathtub is housed in full public view upon the floors of the Catholic palace above. These hidden vaults spared its presence, as if when first displayed, those in possession of it did not recognize the past accomplishment that this so-called bathtub once was. Not only the unusual shape of this other enormous dish for a bathtub, but the technology and techniques of stonework that would have once had to have been utilized to create it. They clearly believe that it was indeed created by Nero himself, and not a past relic of a now lost civilization, with all similar relics found within ancient Egypt exposed as ancient machine stones. The question is, who made these ancient relics? How did they make them? And if made by the claimed builders, why is this technology now lost? They are undoubtedly highly compelling. 
the forager population paradox. Along with a number of other paradoxes found in a number of academic fields of research, is now finally rediscovering much regarding our past, vindicating proof of what we have long argued is still hidden. In many areas, buried under meters of earth or virtually impenetrable forests, chapters of lost human history lay waiting to be found, which due to our research into similarities and differentiating factors within unexplained ruins, at least three advanced civilizations once lost, we claim are now finally being rediscovered. Geological research has proven again and again, through the dating of many natural processes, the submergence of land masses, along with studies into erosion rates. Along with carbon radiation dating, many ruins, once claimed as a mere few thousand years old, have inadvertently, regardless of the subsequent conservative attempts at dating these zones, are now shown to have been undeniably far older. Yet the forager population paradox is scientific evidence which demonstrates that human civilizations did indeed once experience a global catastrophe. Known by many names, the Great Flood, the Great Deluge, Rapture, along with many other names in many ancient texts found all around the world. Only a paradox due to it not fitting with a paradigm. Population growth is a science which can accurately track the history and indeed ancestral origins and age of a species. Yet there lay a problem with the study of human population in particular. At some point within a now forgotten history, the human race experienced an event which reset our population growth. It would seem that even the great effort of bending carbon datings, which we allege are dishonest agings of ancient ruins and the civilizations that built them, was still not conservative enough to hide this truth. Once a thriving ancient population seemingly vanished. Data supported, or rather corroborated by the many unfinished and destroyed ancient relics we often discuss on our channel. According to the proceedings of National Academy of Science USA, in a research project titled Periodic Catastrophes Over Human Evolutionary History Are Necessary to Explain the Forager Population Paradox, they state, and I quote, Investigating multiple demographic scenarios in a large sample of human and chimpanzee populations, we find that periodic catastrophes, combined with plausible fertility or mortality reductions, can reasonably generate zero population growth. Our findings bolster arguments about the role of intergenerational cooperation in supporting the colonizing potential of human populations once released from catastrophes." End quote. Simply put, the only way to explain the population growth or lack of at certain points of our species' history in comparison to its persistently claimed age, the paradox, or the current population, proves that we did indeed experience catastrophe. An event long denied as ever being experienced by our species, with the last acceptably permitted event, K2, having been experienced only by the dinosaurs. We find the data, the paradox, and the methodological truths it exhibits highly compelling. We recently covered the perplexing, yet little shared ancient artifact which can be found at the ancient site of Patara. We covered the fact that some of the inventions accredited to the Romans within the modern day may have been borrowed concepts with origins located far within our distant past. As with the supposed ancient Egyptian sites on the Giza Plateau, many ancient ruins contain megalithic blocks whose movement into position not only evades modern explanation, but lacks any detailed recording of the mammoth task by any of these so-called culprits for constructions. Rather, it seems a worldwide conspiracy has occurred. It is well known that history is written by the victor. Maybe this is a fitting explanation for the academic ignorance witnessed on a daily basis. Perhaps it's laziness on the part of academics, put with the task of explaining these sites? Or perhaps as we have detailed on many, many occasions, a covert effort to occult the truth from modern society. Our claim is not made lightly but upon the witnessing of talented individuals having their careers and future opportunities crushed at the hands of those who fund, 
and therefore steer academic study in the directions of their pleasure. The stolen artifacts which tell of this story, the vast documented efforts of the many organizations around the world, tasked or rather funded to gather, pillage, or steal all such items, merely to paint a picture they are told to. But the truth remains, human history is far more interesting than you have been led to believe. But be warned, paradigm destruction can often be distressing. In the popularly regurgitated marketed phrase, Roman columns, after being presented with the following evidence, may begin to feel more like programming than historically truth. The Baalbek Trilithon, a group of three horizontally lying stones which form part of the podium of the Roman Jupiter Temple of Baalbek, Lebanon. Numerous archaeological expeditions have gone to the site, starting in the 19th century, primarily German and French groups, and research continued into the 20th century. Each of these stones is 70 feet long, 14 feet high, and 10 feet thick, weighing around 800 tons each, and conveniently, each of these modern academic studies concluded the same thing, completely absent of any explanation as to their placement. The entire foundation of this ancient structure is unexplainable, with a number of stones weighing over 350 tons, thus indicative of lost knowledge, not modern architecture. It should seem obvious that to declare otherwise would be foolish, yet this is what's witnessed all over the earth every day and we are yet to mention the world-famous, yet equally perplexing, stone of the pregnant woman, also at Baalbek, and weighing in at an astonishing 1,000 tons. As Yuri Muzik put it, quote, In 27 BC, the Roman Emperor Augustus supposedly took the unfathomable decision to build in the middle of nowhere, the grandest and mightiest temple of antiquity, having no obvious reasons for selecting Baalbek as the temple's building site. The much greater erosion of the big Baalbek blocks qualifies as material proof of their much greater age." End quote. It seems that as we suspected, the evidence is mounting to support the far more logical claim that an advanced lost civilization's heritage has been stolen by different, more modern civilization all over the world. A great civilization did once flourish here on Earth, one which has been actively suppressed, stolen from, exploited, and hidden for far too long. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. Some of the largest, and indeed oldest, megalithic sites upon Earth are mostly classified as ruins due to them indeed being in a dilapidated state. Yet upon our travels around these so-called ruins, we have often found that erosion is not the primary cause of this current state. Many of those built much later than that of the clearly naturally eroded conditions of Cappadocia, where some sections have literally returned to the geologically natural state in which they were first formed, for example. Instead, they appear to have experienced a cataclysm, one possibly involving a great flood, the crack in the unfinished obelisk, unfinished, like countless other ancient sites, abruptly abandoned ancient quarries, ancient builds, structures, even Moai on Easter Island, abandoned at their seeming height of abilities. These places preserved in a state of past bustling, yet these once flourishing stonemason locations are all now moderately damaged, with only those built to an angle and in anticipation of attack or cataclysm surviving in any real significance a testament to the builders of these sites' abilities and insight, yet further confirmation of an unknown event once occurring. The tallest and oldest of obelisks across the globe often lay toppled as if hit by a wave. Could this reinforce the argument of their indeed once being the Great Deluge? One with enough force to topple these multi-ton monuments worldwide? Menhirs are classified as Neolithic monuments some of which, although rarely discussed, weigh sometimes over a hundred tons. This may indeed be part of the reason they are rarely academically explored. The most spectacular of these being the Loch Mariake megaliths, a complex of Neolithic constructions in Loch Mariake, Brittany. It comprises of the elaborate tumulus passage grave, a dolmen known as the Table des Marchands, and the most incredible of the ruins, the broken, or more accurately toppled, men here of Ur-Gra, 
the largest single block of stone so far known to have ever been transported and erected by Neolithic people. This one rock, like the toppled obelisk of Axum, was of a gigantic size, academically claimed as being quarried and transported by people of primitive nature with Stone Age tools. It is estimated that it weighed over 330 tons when first placed. The question is, like countless other claimed Neolithic ruins, how did they achieve such feats? How did they lift such enormous stones? Were they, like we have posited many times before, the remnants of a once advanced yet destroyed ancient civilization? We find such possibilities, in particular, the men here of Ergra, highly compelling.